it's been a pleasure getting to know her better and personally. Um, she reminds me a lot of my mother, who is an English teacher that I love and respect very much. Um, so uh, I am very, very pleased to introduce to you uh, a woman who's worked very hard on a book about her book in the process. And um, so uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce her. Like this. Thank you, Mandy. Uh, Mandy has been one of my top proponents in recent months, and so I think we at Spencer here are very lucky to have her. She is a great young lady. And I, I thank my audience here tonight. Uh, without you, I would not have anybody to talk to and, and uh, share information with. And uh, that that's kind of what I figure I am in this situation. I, have said time after time, I am not a fair expert. Many of you know more about the fair probably than I do. But I uh, spent about 10 months gathering fair stories, Clay County fair stories, and uh, with the encouragement of people like Ron Bauermeister and, and many others in the community, um, I gathered stories and, and have been a storyteller with this book, uh, Fair Goers Do Not Live on Fried Food Alone. Since we are in the library environment, I'm going to um, talk a little bit tonight about the contents of the book, about some of the behind the scenes stories, or you might say between the lines stories, and then also some of the generalizations of my learning through the process of writing a book. Uh, the first chapter was sort of a challenge um, because Time after time after time, even today over in, El in Emmitsburg, I heard, oh, all we ever ate was the chicken dinner in the parking lot <laughs> and potato salad. And that's what many, many people did for years. They ate their ham or their chicken dinner um, that they brought for lunch and then again for supper. And they either ate at a picnic table or they ate in the parking lot. As a matter of fact, there still are families that are doing that. Uh, a, a former co-worker from the high school has a large family, many siblings, and they plan on getting together for the, the centennial. One brother won't come unless they eat in the parking lot. And I, think that's, I think that's a precious story. Um, but uh, I did start the first chapter with In the Beginning of Clay County, and if I had known, I had forgotten that at one point Peterson was the county seat, and then there was a vote, and the county seat became Clay County. Um, my main sources for the first chapter included this little book from the Historical Society, Iowa Historical Society. I came across um, a topic when I was researching on my tablet, and I came across a reference to Palimpsest. I had never heard of it before, maybe because my library science background is from Minnesota, um, but I came across this, found one online, probably eBay, for about $7, ordered it, and wow, was that a wealth of information. The library does have, Mandy showed me, in the back room, an entire shelf of these. And uh, so, so that's interesting. The vertical file also had some gems in it. Uh, when I came across the um, 1889 premium book with 64 pages in it, oh. advertisements on one side, and then fair department lists on the other side, I was just blown away to think in 1889, agriculture and business worked together to produce something like that. Uh, Mary Houston's book um, from 75 years was a big help, as well as oral histories and as well as newspapers. And you may be thinking, why did I never see her at the library with the microfilm? Well, I was here. But technology has come a long way. And if you have a library card on the library website, lower left, take a look. National Archive of Newspapers. 
and you can log in and have access to that. And so I did a lot of research on the tablet. Uh, my husband is more of a TV watcher than I am, so uh, while he'd be watching TV, I'd be looking through old newspapers, finding this, that, and everything. Um, but the early days, you could tell even before the association formed uh, in the years of 1917, 1918, there was definitely perseverance. Um, people around Clay County, those pioneers, wanted a fair. Um, even after grasshoppers, the plague sent many farmers back east to Wisconsin or even further east than that. Um, the grasshopper plagues that were described so that it looked like there was an eclipse of the sun. They ate clothing off the lines. They ate fence posts. And I, I would think I'd have given up as a pioneer farmer. But many persevered and, uh, and they continued going uh, to the point where they organized at the Grand Opera House the association, which of course probably the defining moment for Clay County Fair history. Uh, shortly after the association formed, the Grandstand Association formed. Uh, their bylaws have definitely changed. The association and its structure have changed. Uh, however, um, that indeed was the basis, and those were the people that we have to thank for the structure of the fair. Uh, from what I read, there were a lot of late night discussions at the Grand Opera House. And I'm thinking there were some pretty strong-minded people in that first association, the executive board. Uh, they had different ideas where the money should be spent. Uh, they had a different ideas whether it should go for entertainment, agriculture, education, and articles in the paper actually indicate that they talk sometimes until the wee hours of the morning at the Grand Opera House. They definitely were unanimous, though, on the idea that the fair should be bigger and better. And uh, when I say they were unanimous about that, as early as 1918, the fair was deemed Iowa's largest county fair. 30,000 members, 16,000 at the gate. Uh, the following year, Board of Directors asked for the united support and cooperation of the general public and stockholders in making the second fair a success. Um, Secretary Emmy Bacon urged farmers to exhibit more in 1919, which resulted in 1,200 exhibiting pork producers, 450 more than any other county fair in the state. And interesting, that year too, the entrance gates, the oldest structures at the fair, were completed. Uh, bigger and better is exactly what uh, people were indicating. Uh, a lot of information in those newspapers, uh, in the sources I used, it was hard to know what to choose. I, I knew I would leave out names for every era. And in some ways, maybe it was better to be an outsider because I can always just say, hey, I'm just a dairy farmer's daughter from Minnesota. I don't know much. <laughs> but um, I ended up, number one, recurring comments that I came across. For instance, in the 1920s, uh, Charles Gilmore from Sioux Rapids was a board member and he suggested we need more fair, free entertainment. We don't want this fair to just be for the rich. And I think that has been a concern all along for the fair board. 1922, I loved finding that there were two carloads from the interstate fair in Sioux City. They came up to the fair and all the way home they talked about what does Clay County have that we don't have at <laughs> our fair? How do they get those people there? And, uh, and then second, I, I chose images of those early fair days. 
English teachers like to em emphasize sense imagery, smells, taste, sound. Um, C.W. Hoxie, I, I wish I had known, he was a Civil War veteran who for over 16 years wrote lyrics for fair songs. And I include one in the book, the lyrics and the tune would be when Johnny comes marching home. Um, another image, I, I could just see people standing around uh, looking in the early, I think it was 20s or late 20s, at Al, Compo Al Capone's $20,000 bulletproof car. And then uh, I also included, especially, I, probably throughout the entire book, I have to admit, things that I personally reacted to and, and hope other people don't mind that I throw in various tangents. Um, during the Depression years, jeweler Ralph Nelson, big advertisement for knife blades. And I'm thinking during the Depression, he probably sold more knives than jewelry, maybe. And in that same paper, the headline read, this was in the 1930s, Hitler's regime losing popularity. Hmm. And of course, hindsight is better than foresight sometimes. Uh, I had to catch myself and, and remember the title that came to my mind early was Fair Goers Don't Live on Fried Food Alone. So with food as the focus, church meals, church halls were brought into the first chapter. In the 20s, a lot of churches were built in Spencer. Uh, they had mortgages to pay off and so they offered an option to those chicken dinners in the parking lot. Uh, the Methodist Church was one. Roland Chamberlain in Clay County History Book mentioned that he collected chickens from farmers ahead of time and then uh, they dressed them at church and if you don't know what that means, to dress a chicken, check with your grandparents. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, they also then uh, kept them at the Spencer Locker before the fair. Um, more than just church meals, uh, Bob Keir is a name that might be familiar with a lot of you. Bob Keir, in a Kiwanis speech, mentioned that in 1941 there were 150 concession stands at the fair. Wow. And that seems like a lot, but I think a lot of them might have been, um, oh, ice cream, popcorn, cotton candy, definitely not the elaborate array that we have today at the fair. World War II, national government requested no fairs. That was difficult for some because that would have been the 25th anniversary for the Clay County Fair. Uh, the airport was used for a short time for World War II glider pilot training. And I think Spencer's Bernie Wheeler, his wife Claire, have uh, informed a lot of people in the past about that situation. I ended up coming up with a mystery for a researcher. On my tablet, I found this lovely book, and uh, it was uh, World War II glider pilot training. Angus Reed had written a great account of the people of Spencer and how generous they were. Angus Reed was from Texas, um, and I couldn't find it on our personal computer. Well, that's because I found it in, I think, Google Scholar or Google Books. You know, one of those things that English teachers talk about using, but never really uh, use it a lot of times. And so that, that was interesting. But he told how every two weeks, 200 students were arriving uh, for the glider pilot training. One week, 200 extra students came. And so they were overloaded. They'd use the 4-H dorms for housing. Um, people of Spencer stepped up to the plate, opened up their homes. Uh, the state fair even sent up some bedding, some cots. And then just the discussion that he had in that book for makes makeshift supplies to help prepare the, the glider pilots I thought was really interesting. Uh, Post-war activity, the community really pitched in and helped renovate the buildings. And then 50s and 60s, I kept coming across all sorts of information I wanted to include. 
a lot of it had nothing to do with the fair. Mm -hmm. But Spencer, what a boom town in the 50s and 60s. Um, in 1956, 76 homes were built. And uh, just advances in mass media and transportation, of course, affected the popularity of the um, Clay County Fair. Um, I, I don't dwell a lot on that era because I figured as a baby boomer that's probably why I was so interested in it <laughs> and I figured there are a lot of other baby boomers that are going to have you know memories of the Clay County Fair. So I end that chapter with um, oh, talking a bit about Vern Ross is interesting, um, the time and influence that he and Whit Sales had on the fair. Um, visited with Keith Bress and how for many years the Clay County Fair meant their family's livelihood. And uh, he, I think, might have been one of the first people who used the phrase fair friends. So many people have fair friends, people they see just once a year. The Bress family is really good friends with Billy Newcomb. He'd be the food chopper guy. His family business has been coming here for over 80 years to the mm -hmm. fair. And uh, at one point, Keith said they used to sell them meat, and then he would take it home and distribute the meat to his neighbors in the Twin Cities area. Chapter two leads right into family matters. All of the different types of family cafes, the Langdon Hall, Ruth Wittenberg's husband Chuck was involved with three other gentlemen. She remembers working with her sister-in-law late at night when uh, Chuck was still at his restaurant bar on the south end of town. And uh, Ruth remembers some rather shady characters approaching <laughs> and what the, she and her sister-in-law said to one another. They were grateful when Charlie or Chuck, Chuck would uh, come and arrive after the bar closed at two o'clock. She remembered too at the end of the fair how um, some of the Carneys were victims of the Oklahoma Dust Bowl, and so they um, were destitute. And they would sometimes come the last day of the fair and they would give them any of the food that they had left. Uh, the Jones lunch, uh, they live up in Milford, uh, the family now that, that has it. Oh, at one point I think it was the Linden and the Flack Shack. Uh, visited with, I don't remember his first name, Mr. Flack from Texas, um, whose parents had it for a short time. And he said, yeah, they didn't have it very long, but man, they really did well with that. It was <laughs> worth them having it. Uh, the Jones family just, you, know, you, could, you could just tell they love what they do every year. It's like a family reunion for them. The warmth that they have in their voice for the nursing home people who come and get a donut and root beer or seven up on, on a special day. And the Macross and Boys Ranch group used to come and they'd have a smorgasbord after showing their horses. And uh, just some of the, the people that they remember from those instances. Stubbs uh, would, of course, be another family restaurant. And uh, Stubbs, anybody familiar with Spencer, realizes all three of his restaurants were icons in Spencer. And all connected, related somewhat to the fair, whether with advertising on the placemats. Um, something interesting I found was Ryder Austinstead and uh, Al Long used no architect's diagram to build Stubbs Ranch Kitchen. Huh. They just started it and then adapted as they went. Uh, Bruce Lamport, partner, and, and then eventually had Stubbs. Um, fun visiting with him, the memories that man has, uh, especially with the fair. And then he said, I have a few things in my basement. So we trucked down to his basement. It was <laughs> just nostalgia. You know, I couldn't resist putting a plate uh, with Western figures on it in the book, even though it was from Stubbs Kitchen and had nothing to do with the Clay County Fair. I just thought, you know, special memories that people have. Um, definitely left Spencer. Um, he and others were involved, of course, with the Chuck Wagon races coming, Pony Express, and, and many other um, ways where that, that they were involved, including his children and Tom and Debbie. Uh, the Curtis Cafe, 
I went through a lot of different families. Uh, now Julie's Diner, uh, the red building out there, various owners had it, but it appears to me from talking with people there are definitely two constants. One would be the delicious pie, and then also the wise men are a tradition for that location. And uh, they apparently are quite entertaining every morning when they meet and uh, greet the staff. Um, the agriculture building, I think I worded that inside and outside the agriculture building. And even though it is no more, some of the traditions will continue on. At the time of uh, writing and, and press, I didn't know where the Smith family snow cones would be located, but they will still be at the fair. But um, the five Smith children spent a great deal of time at the fair with Shirley and Tom's snow cones. And now, of course, Becky and Brent have the snow cone stand. Um, Dingman's had, uh, Lyle Dingman had the beef burgers where Mitzi Wagner was for a little bit and uh, it was fun talking. I think his name is Randy Dingman, remembered the um, toy tractors that his father had and now Randy has a huge interest in toy tractors. Uh, chapter three, Sweet Tooth, I move on to and the oldest food concessionaire, Phil Hirsch shared, um, was the Isabel Burke Taffy. They have three locations at the fair. Billy Oz and his wife Mary have that concession now. They're from over by Mason City, I think Plymouth, Iowa. Their last name is capital O, capital Z. I didn't include this in the book, but very interesting. Um, highly educated people and when they adopted two children they wanted their family to have its own entity and so they took his last initial her last initial capital O capital Z that's their last name and uh, Norman the, the little guy that's pictured in the book he has quite a history um, that I share in the book. He's that little statue, the taffy polar. Uh, Nielsen's tire, don't eat the tires, but they are the longest um, vendor, non-food vendor, so I included some information about them. Uh, mini donuts, Margaret and Stu Mackey for many years had mini donuts by the west end of the horse barn. And uh, we had a chance to visit with her, Jackie and Randy in um, Phoenix last winter, and I was so impressed. Margaret brought out her bookkeeping. She had every baseball game, every event they attended, Vicks Corner, etc. And I thought, you know what? If that's how she did it, that's how I'm going to do it. And Ron, don't you think this works? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I had an accountant ask me recently, are you keeping track? And I thought, yeah. You know, at first I was going to do it on the computer, but this works better. And uh, so it was fun visiting with her. Um, now the Petskas have that mini donut stand, and, and uh, they have a horse that likes their donuts, no other donuts on the fairground. And uh, I, I tried to find out the owners of that horse, but I, I couldn't. I also uh, enjoyed visiting with them, uh, their descriptions of their hot dogs. I don't even like hot dogs, but I was about salivating <laughs> to hearing how good they are and where they get the, the supplies for their hot dogs. Um, I really wanted to include in the book Jan did, I think, all of the trip with Chuck Offenberger across the United States. But I thought, there's no way. There's, I can't weave this in. So I left that part out. But I, I think it'd be fun for them to write a book about that. Uh, Leah Wyman and the Wyman family spud nut history is, is special to Spencer. And, uh, and so that's included in that chapter also. Chapter four is called, Where's the Meat? Chop Shop and Branding Iron have the most emphasis in that chapter. And I think Clay <laughs> County is especially fortunate to have those two entities in town. They do a great deal 
during the fair and other times of year. I also couldn't help but include some advertising on page 60 in the book. I kept coming across a lot of chefs ad, chefs sold chicken, I don't know if anybody remembers that. Mm -hmm. And then Bill's advertised a lot. This one in particular has several things written up. Bill's been down in Arkansas raising these wonderful chickens just to give you the finest eating you ever had. And also those big breasted chickens that were written up in Life Magazine. Of course, <laughs> Life Magazine had um, quite a, a section in it, as did Fortune Magazine on Spencer. And uh, I did not contact either of them because I didn't want to pay the royalties for pictures. So, so I didn't uh, include a lot about that. Join the Club, Chapter 5. It was interesting because there's so much volunteerism. But at one point I felt almost as though I was hearing the same story and writing the same story about all the volunteerism and the preparation. And I think I made a comment to a couple people, maybe I should leave that out. And they said, no, that's what the fair is all about. You know, all of the clubs, service clubs that we have participating. Um, the commercial club, early on in Spencer's history became the Chamber of Commerce and they were the fair association and they had a great deal of control and then um, Kiwanis came along in the 1960s I learned and the Chamber didn't really want another service organization in town and so some interesting information um, Mary Lou Reed's father, Herb Safely, was Sierra involved. Johnson. Yeah, and Herb Safely oh, were involved yeah. with uh, um, the Kiwanis coming to town. As a matter of fact, um, even read about threats to the newspaper editor and school board or school superintendent if they would join Kiwanis, they could lose their jobs. <laughs> Um, <laughs> you know, so I commend these chamber people for their strong-mindedness. They knew what they were doing with the fair. They had control and knew what they were doing. But yet they did bend, and eventually a lot of those chamber members mm -hmm. became Kiwanis members, mm -hmm. active Kiwanis members, and realized, mm -hmm. you know, Spencer had room for more than one organization. Uh, Shriners. <clears throat> have a long affiliation with the fair and fairgrounds, Tri-T, um, I, I hope I didn't miss any of the service clubs that have been involved. 4-H, FFA in that chapter, and of course 4-H could have been a book in and of mm -hmm. itself. I really had hoped some other people would write a book about <laughs> some of these areas, um, but it's interesting how much 4-H has changed Really, it's no longer a club, and uh, you can read about that in the book. Chapter 6, Nuts to You. Uh, there are a number of nutty stands at the fair. Dotson's <laughs> had, of course, the nut stand. Alice, Niles' mother, was the whistler that many older folks remember. Um, Niles was telling that the North Mall was the first mall in Iowa, and I thought that was pretty cool, so I couldn't resist putting a picture of the North Mall in there. Uh, the Bankses now have the peanut stand, and uh, Sherry told all about boiled peanuts. I don't know, I, I might try them this year, just because I've never had them. Uh, col Colonial Nut Roll, uh, Dave, who has that, is also up at Arnold's Park. Um, Rabob is his wife and uh, I don't know how many of you are aware of that. Uh, the Wise Nutty Bar Story, um, that could be a book in and of itself, and um, lots of pictures, wonderful pictures, memories that people have in connection with working that. I had intended to end the book with chapter seven, the, uh, and I was going to call it We've Come a Long Ways. After 
visits, after research, I decided the more things change, the more they remain the same. Um, visiting with Jeremy Parsons and Dave Sinington, they both nodded their heads. And, and, and it is, you know, there were artists back in the beginning, art bar now, you know, music, agriculture, the focus, still. You know, so much has not changed. And so chapter seven, we've come a, long, I've come a long way, became the more things change, the more they remain the same. I start with the people, and I mention um, the association, of course, from the beginning, the current executive board, presidents, directors, CEO, and then other traditions. And thank goodness, agriculture starts with an A because having grown up on a registered Holstein dairy farm, <laughs> my deceased fa father would be very upset if that didn't have some kind of priority. He'd have thought I should have had a lot more pictures and a lot more emphasis on agriculture because he loved the Clay County Fair, as many mm -hmm. of my relatives do. Um, arts is next, Clay County Fair Queen, Creative culinary with the traditions and family, education at the fair, you know, is increasing yearly, entertainment. Um, do I have some of Judy Hemphill's lovely pictures of people like Garth Brooks and, and Brad Paisley? No. Uh, Phil Hurst, when I visited with him four days before he passed away, said, you want to talk to people like Garth Brooks, call them. And I kept thinking, I don't want to call Garth Brooks and say, hi, this is a retired English teacher from Spencer Isle, blah, blah, blah. And so Dave Potratz and I had a nice visit, and, and I think we comfortably addressed the fact that I didn't want to call famous people, and I, I didn't want to pay large dollars to use their pictures. and. Um, the, some of the other food establishments, uh, racing, another tradition, that could be an entire book in and of itself, a tradition that was at the first fair, every fair probably thereafter, and uh, it's just one of those constants, kind of, kind of like horses I think have been at every fair, uh, ice cream at every fair. Um, I added tidbits and morsels because there was a lot of information I wanted to include that I didn't know where else to put it. Phil had told his alligator story, which some of you may have heard. Um, Kachunga, the alligator, one year became rather cold at night. And so about three o'clock in the morning, Phil received a phone call. A deceased alligator <laughs> was on the hands Aww. of the alligator folks. Aww. So they, they buried it and Phil, with a grin, looked and twinkled in his eye, said, picture 5,000 years from now, <laughs> when somebody digs up alligator balls in Clay County, Iowa. That's cute. Um, cracked pecans in a bag, I think a lot of people remember that. I know my mother-in-law from El Algona area always wanted us to get as many as we could. Um, just various things that are included there. The chapter ends with veterans, end of the alphabet veterans, and I think Spencer Clay County Fair has one of the nicest tributes to veterans. Um, Phil Hurst, I think, was very involved along with the Wallers getting that going, and they have a lot to be proud of. A lot of uh, experienced military personnel who have spoken. Um, I, I wanted to get young people's impressions and so I went out to the National Guard Armory and I, I quote some of the comments they make and they took this very seriously when I asked them and I, I think I spent a half hour while some of them thought and wrote out what that day means to them and I thought I can't end on a somber note I need another chapter <laughs> What did I teach as an English teacher? A good conclusion goes back to the beginning. In the beginning, at the beginning, in the future. And so I scrambled at the end to finish the book. I took a lot of young people's pictures from various places, put them at the end of the book, called it in the future, and it ends simply, 
with a couple paragraphs and my saying, assuredly, yesterday's children will become tomorrow's hair shapers. A few other sentences, and then I say, after all the fair, their relationships and their traditions are unstoppable for making this the world's greatest county fair. And I always tear up when I read that, even if I read it silently, because when I came up with that, I thought, yes, it's done. <laughs> uh, but I learned a lot. I learned that uh, the writing process, indeed, is never done, and I should have started way sooner. The revising, the editing, the changing, the subheads, the, you know, trying to get it where you want it. I, I learned, don't, don't overlook resources. I remember PE teacher Bev Ahern saying on the obstacle course, use your available resources. And whether it was gathering information or in the publishing process, um, the number of pictures in the book made a challenge. About four months before it was finalized, I realized I couldn't go the avenue I wanted to in online publishing which would have made the book about half the price. Um, I contacted several people who, uh, local type authors from Des Moines, um, Carson Ode, uh, his last book, he and his wife retired um, Meredith Corporation, graphic artists, and his, his la their last book I think is Iowa Spaces, Places, Faces. It's in the window at Arts on Grand. Beautiful books, coffee table books. And by the end of the conversation, you know, he said, keep up the good work. You know, and I said, could you mentor me in the future? But I never did contact him again. But I ended up going with who he used for his third book, um, GNR Publishing over at Waverly. So the entire book was produced in Iowa, okay. either Waverly or Cedar Falls. Cedar Rapids, excuse me. Um, you know, he said the first two books we had done overseas in China and uh, South Korea are where a lot of self-published authors send their books. Sure, it could have been less expensive. Um, black and white was a temptation, but I'm glad that it, it's not in black and white. Um, and then, of course, third, I learned that people are even more passionate than I thought about our Clay County Fair. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Do you have any questions? Did you keep a record of how many hours you put into this? Does that include thinking? <laughs> <laughs> Ideas for Dreaming, traveling, interviewing, <laughs> everything. Um, my, my family has a tendency toward bipolar. Some of you know there have, well, I'm serious. There have been a lot of suicide attempts in my family, no successes. Being manic at time help. <laughs> oh, Arla. <laughs> oh, it had to be hours and hours. So what you're saying is you did not contact all these people to get their permission to put their picture on the paper cover. <laughs> I didn't have to, Yeah, because it was taken by the official fair. There you go. I did uh, some individual children. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. Concept in the head to the printed. How long did that take you? Uh, well, my sorry. first interview was in July. I thought of it in April and started scratching around, listening to some oral histories. Well, might have been May. So were you gun home right off the bat or was no, it I was just scared. a no, dabbling to see if there oh, was Oh, oh, I I had this idea thinking somebody needs to do this. Mm -hmm. Somebody needs to record some of these mm -hmm. memories. Um my memoir groups at, at uh, Spencer, I think, were kind of an inspiration because I'd heard, you know, different fair stories from them. Um I don't care to write about myself. And so I have to confess that in some ways when I had this idea for a book, that meant I wouldn't have to write about myself. <laughs> um, but it, it was fun to do. 
you know, the, the self-promoting is the hardest part. Um, but people are receptive over, stopped in at Algona Chamber of Commerce and they were so excited today, you know. Stopped at, at Emmitsburg, just different places. I just wish I had more time. So did you and A lot of speaking engagements lined up, various libraries throughout yeah. Iowa. Did you and I have a copy editor that you had to report to and, and jump to their tune? Uh, no. Okay. No, no. That was part of what made them less expensive. Um, I haven't read the entire book after publication. What I have, I've come across some mistakes. You will come across some mistakes. There are some misplaced modifiers in there. <sighs> <laughs> I, I did have a few I did have a few people edit most of the parts um, I, I, um, I had one company that I approached indicate they would definitely need to edit because English teachers have a tendency to be flowery <laughs> and I, I did want to say but so. You could think it. <laughs> Any other questions? So all these, this could be a book of its own. This could be a book of its own. When are you going to start the next one? <laughs> you got all, you got the information and you got the right track and you know that where you're going. What's the next book uh, of its own? Mandy Roberts, Mandy Mulehausen. Now uh, she goes by. Our library director is a wonderful artist, mm -hmm. and um, this is going to be the subject, Clayton, the pig, goes to the county fair. So, so it's brewing a, in our heads. Do we book, and you're going to tone it down for a kid's book. Oh, oh, yeah, but you know, pigs do not have... The appeal of cats, you know. Uh, the Clay County Fair does not have the appeal of cats uh, internationally. E.B. White found a way. Uh, that's true. That's true. Uh, and and this my dad is pigs over. will go good in Iowa. Wilbur was great. <laughs> this pig is actually going to read, so it's a nod to it. Orwell, also oh, animal yeah. farm. Yeah, yeah. That's awesome. Go <laughs> well in Iowa, though. The pig will. It'll be easier to do be, because of the publication system I'm familiar with. As long as he doesn't end up a pork chop sandwich at the end. <laughs> <laughs> There's a dark side pork to it. Pork tenderloin. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just, Is that so, your due know. date for next year? What's that? Are you thinking about a due date for next year for that book? There you go, Arlo. We're just starting to collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> Although when ideas come, you well, know, the title you came go. to me last week because I, I had Sorry, already told man yeah. nothing until the end of September. We're not going to work on this until the end of September, and then the title came to me. <laughs> so with that question, the lead-in is where are you selling at the fair? Because you you are able to sell. I mean, the books will be sold on the fairgrounds, correct? Definitely, yeah. Okay. At, through Arts on Grand, at okay. the Art Barn. Okay. And then also the um, Clay County Museum. Okay. Normally that's been under the grandstand. Right. With all of the shifts, uh -huh. my understanding is that is going to be with that's the right. photography department in the industrial building. And Okay. That will be that will be great because I don't know if you realize the photography department has more entries than any other. Yes. Um, That's a good, good point. Mm -hmm. Good point. Yeah. Any well, other questions? You. Well, thank that you for coming. Like I said, it's nice to not have to talk to the walls. So appreciate <laughs> all of you being here. Thanks for your work.